they're blinded by this desire for power that causes them to make decisions that ultimately are harmful to the American people or the foundational principles of our country, the fundamental freedoms like freedom of speech, freedom of religion. For me growing up, you, you just like, this is just the way it is in America. We yeah. are the, the live free or die country. We are supposed to be a beacon of freedom for yeah. the world. But now we have people in congressional hearings saying that free speech doesn't apply to everybody. You mentioned Bobby Kennedy, told a little story in my book about his experience in front of the Committee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government Against the American People. And I'm so glad that they formed this special committee to expose this, because a lot of people aren't really dialed in to what, what is going on, but it is very dangerous, and it is unraveling the foundation of our democratic republic. Thank you for coming. I know you have a book out, and, and I, that's the easiest <laughs> thing to lead with, because really what I want to talk about the most is just this role of partisan politics, yeah. because I'm not someone that's come from a lot of knowledge about politics at all. Like I failed the constitution test to get my GED because I was racing, not because I wasn't smart enough to finish school, but, and I barely passed in eighth grade. So it's just not an area where I felt strong or called, but that's changed. Yeah. Now the strong and smart, I'm not yet, but the called feels yeah. true. For Love of the Country is the yeah. name of your book and your journey to leaving the Democratic Party. So how did that all go? Like was, what was the impetus for being a Democrat and then saying this isn't where I fit in or I don't resonate with this anymore? Yeah, I was homeschooled, I'm the fourth of five kids, grew up in Hawaii and uh, I am so grateful to my parents for choosing to educate us in that way because it gave us a lot of freedom to hmm. pursue, you know, spend time on the things that maybe we needed more time on and speed through the things that, that came easily, but, but actually be able to explore a lot of other experiences. So I grew up doing martial arts, grew up playing music and surfing and hiking, and my parents are small business owners, so we all were pitching in in the family restaurant growing up. Through all of that, they, they raised us to be independent thinkers, not telling us, well, this is what you must believe and this is what you must do, but actually thinking through like, okay, you know, what, what are you, what, what do you want to do? Mm. Think through what are the pros and what are the cons? If, hmm. you, if you go down this path, where do you think it may lead? What are the consequences, both good and bad? And actually just going through that, both with little things and obviously very big decisions in life. And that really laid that strong foundation for me as I eventually got into politics to, to, to hold on to that and have that be the basis, uh, the lens through which I made uh, decisions. And so I'll, I'll start at the beginning in a minute, but just as an example, I spent eight years in Congress. And one of the things that is commonplace there is that every day if you're a Democrat, they have the Democratic whip or the Democratic majority. Uh, they will send out an email saying, here are the votes coming up today, and here is the recommended way to vote. Vote yes on this, vote no on that, et cetera, et cetera. For your party. For your party, and the Republicans have the same. Sure. They send out the very same message, and so oftentimes I found very quickly when people would go down to vote, there's a lot of votes going on, there's a lot of legislation moving through, and so a lot of times people don't really know what they're voting on until they get to the House floor, and they whip out their printed piece of paper saying, okay, which one are we voting on? Okay, yep, that's a yes vote. So no thinking, they just did it. They just Correct, followed, followed that, the... that's the norm. That's the norm, unfortunately. Hmm. Um, I made my staff work really hard and they complain about it sometimes. They're like, we talk to our friends in the other offices. They don't make us, they don't, they don't have to do all this stuff. as like every vote that I have that we know is coming up, you know, sometimes we only have 24 hours notice, sometimes we have longer notice, but I want you to tell me what are the Democrats saying about this bill and why it's good or why it's bad. And then you gotta tell me what the Republicans are saying about the very same bill right. and why they're saying it's good or why it's bad. Yeah. And then, you know, reality is somewhere, somewhere in the middle uh, of that. Uh, but it was important to me to not just see through that partisan lens and actually look at like, is this a good bill? Is this just a political, you know, maneuver? It, like playing political jujitsu, if they do this and vote this that way, then it'll give them a line of attack on this guy when he's running for reelection in a year and a half. All this kind of stuff is what goes into 
the legislation that makes it to the House floor and the decisions that are made. Unfortunately, and this is what's wrong, it's what's so wrong with our system, mm. is that it is the partisan interests very often that are driving the agenda and the next election and how do we win more seats or how do we keep our seats, rather than actually looking at like, okay, here's a problem. Right. What's happening? <laughs> right. And this problem is affecting people in my home state of Hawaii. It's affecting people here in Arizona. It's affecting people in New York. Like, let's, let's figure out how do we solve this problem? Mm -hmm. And sometimes these problems are very small and very easily solved. But rather, they, many times they go unsolved because, let's say, a Republican introduces a bill and the Democrats are in power. They say, well, we can't pass that Republican's bill because then they're going to go back to their district and they're going to say, hey, you guys sent me to Washington to work. I got something done. Here's the legislation I pass. It'll make them look good and make it harder for us to beat him. And this, this exists on both sides. Yeah. Of oh, the yeah. Aisle. No, this is totally, this is partisan politics. This it, is that, a Democrat. That is, this exactly. is a Republican. This exactly. Is just it's the, about who, how this who business is able. Works. It's about power. It's about power. And, and this is what I get into a lot for... For those who will go and read my book, I get into a lot about what are the underlying ills and, and root causes of these institutional like problems that we have in our politics today. And, and it comes down to this insatiable hunger for power by those in Washington, both those elected and those unelected who are working behind the scenes. Mm. And unfortunately, these people lose sight of like, their purpose for being there in the first place, to be public servants, to be representatives of the people in their communities and Maybe in their states. Maybe they didn't states. start with that intention. Maybe they didn't. <laughs> I, know, I know some, you know, I, I know people who did start with that intention yeah. and unfortunately and got into, you know, stuck in this trap of like, well, I got to do this, this, and this, and this to get to a place where I can be in a position to do the things that I set out to do. Right. But somewhere along the way, you're hanging out with all these people who only care about what happens in that little bubble in Washington, mm -hmm. and they just lose touch. Mm. They lose touch with reality, the reality of, of the everyday American's life and both the, the, the challenges and the opportunities. When people come and tell me that they want to, run for, want to run for Congress and ask for my advice, I always ask them why. And you can tell the people who are driven to run for office because they thrive off of the political games or they want to be in the, the centers of power hmm. versus those who are like, Tulsi, I hate politics. I hate politics and I hate everything about Washington, but I really care about my community and there are very real issues that have to be solved and the guys there aren't doing it. Mm. So I have no choice but to step up. I'm like, yes, you are what Washington needs. We need the people there who are disgusted by the partisan political gamesmanship right. and are actually there uh, not seeing it as, um, you know, looking for the red carpet and the people opening doors for you or telling you, you don't have to wait in line anymore. You're a member of Congress, which all of these things happen. The people who are turned off by all of that are the people right. who should be there. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> there are too few of them. Politics is very new for me and it's been, but it's gone fast in a way. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, there was a harebrained idea to have uh, me run for Congress in Arizona. Okay. And I spoke to, it was, uh, I was on Bobby Kennedy's team and a lady named Amaryllis and I know she, her well. um, she's wonderful she's wonderful and we yeah, had a conversation incredible. and look I said the I just need you to know that the likelihood of this is extremely <laughs> low just so you know but I really am fascinated to hear you out she basically said the same thing is yeah. that you know to be in a you know in government was to represent your community it was to it was to speak for the issues happening locally yeah. and or at least maybe it's particularly for Congress, I guess. It somehow lost its way, but originally it was, that was the whole yeah. role of it. And that this, the, and, and then later on, someone else I spoke to, they were like, the, the fact that you don't want to do this is exactly why you're the person that should do <laughs> it's this. It's so true. Right, which is kind of what it's you're absolutely saying. absolutely true. So what is it, so it's the power that people want that gets them 
into a wanting, maybe doing the wrong thing. So what they're, are those they're wrong blinded. things? They're, bli they're blinded by this, this desire for power, either to hold on to it or to get it back, that causes them to, to make decisions that ultimately are harmful to the American people or are harm harmful to, as we are seeing now, uh, the, the, the foundational principles of our country, the rule of law fundamental freedoms like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, things that for me growing up, you, you just like, this is just the way it is in America. We yeah. are the, the live free or die country. We are this country that is supposed to be a beacon of freedom for the yeah. world. Uh, but now we have people in congressional hearings saying that, um, and I can't remember the exact quote, but basically that, that free speech isn't like, doesn't apply to everybody. And uh, you mentioned Bobby Kennedy. Uh, I, t I uh, told a little story in my book about his experience in front of the Committee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government Against the American People. Hmm. It's a mouthful, hmm. but it's what's happening. Hmm. And I'm so glad that they formed this special committee to expose this, because a lot of people, um, you know, they're just trying to live their lives and work and take care of their family mm -hmm. and raise their kids. and and aren't, aren't really dialed in to um, what, what is going on, but it is very dangerous, and it is unraveling the foundation of our democratic republic. But in that hearing, the chairman, Jim Jordan, he had invited Bobby Kennedy to come and speak because he was part, party to a lawsuit that directly addressed how the federal government, is a lawsuit against the federal government, for agencies like the FBI and the White House and others directing uh, social media companies to censor specific social media accounts. Mm -hmm. It's like extremely unconstitutional. Yeah, well, it's totally happening. And it, if it I is post totally something happening. about Bobby, yeah. I get literally half the views. Yeah. Like it's easy to see when stories, yeah. it's, it's absolutely happening. Yeah. And, and that's just one it, example. Exactly, exactly. So this hearing was about free speech, the lawsuit is about free speech. He was invited there to talk about. He is the opening witness, and usually how these committees run is, you know, the majority, they will say a few words, the minority the, the, will say a few words, and then the, the witness kicks off their remarks, and then you have questions and discussion and whatever. Before Bobby could even begin his opening remarks, the Democrats introduced a motion to remove him as a witness from the committee because they did not want any part of platforming his reprehensible, the, the words they use, anti-Asian, anti-Semitic, harmful speech. No basis mm -hmm. to any of these accusations. Mm -hmm. and, and anyway, so this went on, they took a vote. I, I, I won't get into all of it, but, but his comment, uh, I, I have a feeling this was a few months ago. Okay. Um, I think he was already running for president on the Democratic ticket still, though. Okay. And, uh, and it was, um, I, I have a feeling he set aside his prepared remarks and he just kind of like let loose. But one of, these, one of the things he said was how, how ironic it is that I'm sitting here in a hearing about free speech huh. being censored. 100%. But, but it's those kinds of things when you're saying, well, what are the bad things that they are doing in their pursuit of power? It's doing things like that. It is taking away our right to free speech. It's trying to control the information that we are allowed to see and hear uh, in the name of like, well, we want to protect you from misinformation and disinformation. So we're going to, we're, we're only going to allow these voices or these accounts or these messages to come through. We see how they are in over 32 states across the country have taken some action to try to remove Donald Trump from their ballots so that voters don't even have a right to choose who they want to vote for uh, to be president and commander in chief. Obviously, there's a lot going on, not only against Trump in the courts, but against people who challenge the political establishment in Washington. Mm -hmm. And you know their stories go unheard because no one knows who they are. But these things, these things are also happening. And the reason why I, I mean, I'm, I'm traveling across the country speaking about this to everyone who will listen. I write about it in the book and I'm, I'm 
maximizing every platform available because it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican or if you like Joe Biden or you like Donald Trump or you like Bobby Kennedy or, or whatever your feelings about politics are at such a hyper divided time in our country, we should and must be able to come together around protecting our fundamental freedoms, around protecting things like the rule of law, this idea that you know, Lady Justice is blindfolded for a reason, mm -hmm. that we should be able to have you know, even fiery debates on any issue, mm. whether it be in person or on TV or online sure. or whatever, and know that like, cool, we may not agree at the end of it or we might find some areas of agreement that we didn't expect. Whatever that is, this, this is the heart of our democracy. We're, we're in a time where people feel so hopeless and, and I get asked all the time, how is it possible in, in uh, a country that is so torn apart, whether it's based on politics or race or any of these other things, social classes or whatever it is, how is it possible for us to come together? And my message is we've just, we've got to get back to the basics. Look back to our founding fathers. When you actually go back and, and look at the discussions they had, they had huge debates. They had yeah. big fights. <laughs> <laughs> they disagreed about a lot of big things. Like there's things. photos of that, you exactly. know? Exactly. <laughs> they're like all over Rooms the walls of the Capitol. People, yeah. but, but, but how was it possible that in, in the midst of such strong emotion, big passions, really deeply held beliefs, they were able to come up with these founding documents that, that form the foundation of our country um, that, that are just as timeless and relevant today as they were when they wrote them. So those, those founding principles yeah. are the things that we have to be able to come together around. Why do you think it's harder than ever then for there to be communication, for two people that disagree to be able to have a conversation? Why do you think, why do you think that that is not achievable in your mind? There, there's, the mainstream media has a big role to play in it. Social media, big tech has a big role to play in it. Um, this whole idea of cancel culture and censorship where there are actual like real life consequences in some cases, sure. people losing their jobs yeah. because of a tweet they put yeah. out about who mm. they voted for. People are afraid. <laughs> That's my story. That's the only reason why I'm here is because I went to AmFest <laughs> and I posted exactly. a picture with my sister like, hey, we love America. So AmFest, America Fest is the place to be, which is where I saw you speak, which yeah. was, you were amazing. Um, you. And people re re acted as if I was just radical. And they're I like, saw that. I was mag all over the place. And it's like, uh, celebrating America? Yeah. Why don't you love it? You know, yeah. if you don't love it, maybe that's the problem. Yeah. Um, but that is truly what happened. It was like, and, and that's why I feel called, because I'm like, it's a bit more of a like an F you. Why can't I lo <laughs> like say that without being criticized? Yeah. Coming from being democratic to being independent, you know, it's like there's also within the media, it seems like, you know, you can say you, as a more of a liberal or Democrat, there are things that you're allowed to be able to say or believe in, but then as soon as you say something like, I love my country, all of a sudden that's now the weird thing to say yeah. and not okay. Yeah. It's and, crazy. And this is one of the reasons why, why I left the Democratic Party. And there is a difference between the two. There are some Republicans I have strong disagreements with and others that mm. I agree with on, on some or many issues, mm. but there, there has become and, and this is, it makes me sad to say this, but there has become a big distinction between the Democratic Party where saying something like, I love my country, is seen as a right-wing conservative statement. Right. Where uh, having a flag displayed in front of your house is seen as, oh, you must be a MAGA Trump voter. Right. I, I am almost 21 years in the Army. I still serve in the Army Reserve. I, I do love my country yeah. very much, yeah. and I'm not afraid to say it. And this is going back to 2020 when I was a, camp, when I was a, a candidate uh, running for president as a Democrat in the Democratic primary. I made it a point to say that on the debate stage and to say the Pledge of Allegiance because that is something that we should all be proud of. And I knew that in those rooms, there were a lot of people who were afraid to say those words. 
there are so many Democrats who love our country. It's not, it, it, there's so many members of Congress mm -hmm. who are Democrats who mm -hmm. love our country. When I was running for president, I had some, some of my Democrat colleagues at the time would come up to me on the House floor and say like, whisper in my ear in the corner of the room where there were no cameras and no one could see, saying like, oh my gosh, I love everything you're saying, please keep it up, but don't tell anyone I said that. <laughs> there is so much fear of those who challenge what has become the agenda of the Democratic Party, which is like this radical, woke, I don't know. It, it's hard to sum it up in just a few words because when you think about it, it's just insane. Mm -hmm. It's insane. At least in the Republican Party, uh, at least in many circles, they still celebrate free speech. You can see some pretty fierce debates and dis disagreements within the Republican Party, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Let's break it down then. If it's like I'm, you know, I love my country, yeah, and I'm proud of be proud of my country. What does that mean? Like, what, what, what are, what do we love? What, what are well, we proud you know, of? I think for me, um, when I hear the Star Spangled Banner, and when I say I love my country, and when I'm saluting the flag, um, I think of my brothers and sisters that I've had the privilege of serving with. I think of those who I deployed with, who paid the ultimate price and never came home. I think of their families who never got to say goodbye. And I think of all of those from every generation who have come before us motivated by that same love. Love of country, love of freedom, um, and love for that which makes us unique as a country. Uh, and, and it really is fundamentally based on freedom mm. and not just freedom in kind of a blase sense, but going back to, again, our founding documents, our, our God-given rights that are enshrined in the Constitution um, that allow us mm. to be in a position, whatever our background or our story or our experience, to love God and express our faith if we choose, or not. Or not. If to that's be your what own we individual choose. Self. To be very outspoken about how strongly we feel about an issue, mm. or not. Live a quiet life. Go live in the jungle on the big island of Hawaii, and you don't have to be bothered by anyone for any reason. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is, I mean, to me, that is what we who wear the uniform swear to uphold when we take our oath and when we enlist. And, and I do, I still get goosebumps and I still get a little choked up uh, when they play our national anthem. And it's unfortunate to me that there are those in this country, many of whom are in the Democratic Party uh, and the Democrat elite, who cringe when they hear the national anthem. That's crazy. Because they think of all that they hate about what goes on in our country, or all that they hate about the bad things that have happened in our country, forgetting some of our heroes. You know, when you look back at Martin Luther King, when you look at the extreme adversity that he and his cohorts faced, mm -hmm. what they were fighting for, how they religiously stuck to the discipline of peaceful protest, even as they were getting beat sometimes to death. And instead of reacting to that violence and that hatred and that darkness and evil with lashing out and striking back with more darkness, Martin Luther King talked over and over and over again about how essential it was to respond with love mm. and how essential it was to remember the promise of what it means to be an American, hmm. to remember the promise of the words that are in our founding documents, that all men are created equal, endowed by our creator with these unalienable rights to pursue life, to, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Even in those darkest of times, which is hard, to us, hard for us to imagine having to live through that today, during those darkest of times, Martin Luther King was reminding his friends, his brothers who were criticizing him, saying, hey, it is time to take up arms. We have to fight. 
We have to fight for our lives and our families and our babies and their future. Even at that time, he said, no, hmm. we cannot allow them to win. We can't allow them being those who are, are covered in darkness to win. The problem that we're, one of the problems that we are seeing today is that there are people who look back to Martin Luther King's dream. They look back to his words and they say, well, that was true then, but it's not true today. And that's where you get all this craziness of like, well, all white people are racist. If you're white, you cannot not be racist. <laughs> and if you say that you're not racist and you're white, that just proves that you really are racist, but you just won't admit it. And just mm. All of this craziness that goes on, it, it, it defies and dishonors, uh, to me, the, the, dr the dream of Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. But even more than that, everything that all of these civil rights icons sacrificed mm. so that we can sit here in a place today yeah. and, and that their reality is not our reality. I almost feel like we're at a point in time where it feels like more is coming to the surface. I don't yeah. know if you get spiritual at all, yeah, but, very much so. but it feels to me like a time when traumas are coming up, division and issues are coming up more and more to deal with. and. A lot of times it goes so far one way to find its middle yeah. and it's been repressed and now it's expressed and some of that is not the best expression, yeah. whether it be anger, rage, violence or canceling or whatever it might be. I have hope that there's some common ground to be found and that this is a phase that we're in mm -hmm. because there's so much of this like frustration and anger on sides that feels irrational. I, I agree. I think there's a lot that is maybe has been simmering below the surface and things that are coming to light. Uh, a lot of people blame Donald Trump for bringing all of this to light. Uh, the, the problem what is... What aspect would that be, bringing what? what? Uh, you know, they, they accuse him of, um, you know, awakening a, a, a whole generation of racists or, you know, mm. I mean, they, they use really... Mm horrible terms that I think are uh, intentionally incendiary for political reasons and quite dangerous actually. Things like, oh, he's the Nazi of this generation and, and uh, all, of, all of this stuff that has resulted in people like Hillary Clinton saying, well, Trump supporters are, I forget her exact words, but she said they're, they belong in a blasket, basket of deplorables. Mm -hmm. Then you have President Biden giving a speech saying that you know, all of the MAGA Republicans, which, you know, there's like however many millions of people voted for the guys, half the country essentially, mm -hmm. they pose the most extreme threat to our country and essentially called them domestic terrorists. Wow. So there are very real consequences to the language that's being used, but, but the problem with the way that they are responding to things like this, hey, well, there's a rise of hate speech, there's a rise of this, there's a rise of that, is censorship. Hmm. When all that will do is make people really angry <laughs> and superficially perhaps bury it. Yeah and only temporarily right. and leave it to stew and get worse exactly. below the surface. Yep. When we know, again, when we look through history, the best way to respond to hate speech is with better speech. Yeah. And the better way to respond to a negative argument is with a superior argument. Mm. And so it only further proves the point of why free speech is is so important and, and this is specifically relevant very much so to what we're dealing with today with, with social media and these big corporations mm -hmm. and some of them, as you said, uh, I've seen it too with Facebook and Instagram. Very clear decisions to, to literally shut off people's accounts or 100%. shadow ban or mm -hmm. whatever if they don't like what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing you can do about it. No. Obviously, uh, Twitter, now X, is, is um, in the crosshairs of, of all of this as people are accusing them because of Elon Musk's decision to keep it as a free speech platform. They're saying, well, what are you going to do? Do you agree with that? I do. Are you glad 100%. that he took it over? Absolutely. It's, it is, it's the only big tech social media company um, that has taken that staunch position. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but it hasn't come without problems for them as they are accused of, why are you allowing hate speech on your site? And I think their approach is, is the right one, which is hate speech in our society is a problem. What I may be offended by and consider hate speech, you may not. Right. And vice versa. Totally. This is what's called being triggered. Exactly. You know, if you don't have the trigger inside of you for it, if you don't see things like that, we don't see things as they are. We yes. see things as we are. Yes. Exactly. And so why would some employee at X or the CEO or even Elon Musk, why should they be in a position to tell me what is hate speech and what is not? And, and so their position is, is correct, in my opinion, which is we as a society have a responsibility to elevate the speech in our society. Amen. And not rely on some corporation or some government right. entity to tell us, oh, here's what you're supposed to be offended by, Danica. Hmm. Get with the program. Or here's what you're not supposed to be offended by. If you are, you're wrong. It's, it, all of these things that we're talking about, to me, they all come back to the same basic foundation of freedom, individual liberty, allow us to think for ourselves, make our own decisions, that decision might end up being a mistake. Cool, we gotta learn from those lessons. But those decisions need to be ours. Um, they need to be ours to yeah. make in a society that, that is supposed to be free. And, and this is my concern in this, in this uh, time that we are living in and why this election is so critical is uh, a society that was built to be free is increasingly not free. 100%. One of the things that I find so frustrating, I think, is the, is just general partisan politics at all. Like, yeah. I have it red or blue at all. Like, you just talked about at the beginning about how you'd, you'd get the sheet that said what to vote for yeah. that had nothing to do with actually applying your mind and your um, your team to a project to figure out what what is really going on. Yeah. That just has to do with following orders. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like that feels... It feels unnatural even in a voting process that you just go, oh, I just vote, vote this way. Exactly. You're not listening to anyone. Mm -hmm. And just like in, in Congress, you weren't having to listen. It was just follow these rules. And so I wonder, like at the, I really wonder, what is the point? Like where did Democrat, Republican come for? What is the value of it? And do we even need to keep it? Um, again, going back here you are to as the, an independent, which is neither. <laughs> I know. Going back to the Federalist Papers and and some of the the warnings that were sounded by uh, some of our founding fathers, they they warned against the power of political parties that they would ultimately serve their own purpose rather than serve the interest of the people and almost to a word <laughs> what they warned against is exactly what we are living through now. Part of how the political parties got so powerful is through the uh, campaign spending and campaign finance laws. So as you, as you probably know at this point, even as you're beginning your entry into yep. this, <laughs> this political mess that we're living in right now, if you were to run for Congress, there is a limit. If I wanted to donate to your campaign, there's a limit on how much I can donate to your campaign. Depending on what party, right? Or no, depending on parties for any at all. congressional candidate. Okay. If you are a candidate running for Congress, the Federal Elections Commission, the FEC laws say, uh, and it changes, it's, I think it's probably close to $3,000 right now, but it says that, okay, any individual can donate up to that amount to your campaign. Okay. So if I write you a $5,000 check, I'm breaking the law and I'm not doing you any favors. Mm. And in that case, it'd be like, hey, Tulsi, I gotta, you got to take back a couple grand to this so you're, you're following the law. You have these limits. At a certain point, uh, political parties used to have those same limits. That ceiling was lifted. So while I could only write you a $3,000 check, if I wanted to, and if I was had the money, which I don't, but I could write, I could write uh, the Democrat or Republican Party a million dollar check. What this did was it put the political parties in such a position of power mm. to hold an incredible amount of leverage oh, yeah. over you 
as a new member of Congress, I'm just, I'm not, I'm hypothesizing here, Dan. Simmer down now. <laughs> as you as Hypothetically. a new member of Congress from a state like Arizona, where, you know, some would say it's purple-ish, where a lot of, there, there's, there are a few yeah. districts here, at least, a it's few. It's called a battleground state-ish, Exactly. Right? Yeah. And there are at least a few districts that are considered battleground districts that constantly switch sides, either Democrat or Republican. And, and so, and I've seen this happen to friends of mine in Congress who um, they're there on the House floor and they've got a tough vote where they can vote their conscience and the way that they feel their constituency would want them to vote. And then the other side uh, of that, the, the opposite vote is one that the party wants them to do because the party wants a win on whatever the issue is. And so in that moment, at that time, it was then either Speaker or Majority Leader Nancy Pelosi, it's a close vote. She's going and saying, hey, where is so-and-so? Where is so-and-so? I, I need him to vote for this. Mm. And there are threats that are made saying, if you don't vote with us on this, those $5 million that the party had earmarked to go towards helping you get reelected, oh, yeah. that's gone. We're huh. out. Oh, yeah. Uh, big industries like Big Pharma, they do the same thing. A lot Money of lobbyists and industries are the arm of the political party. And if you're not with them on the issue, it's like, yeah, cool. Uh, we're not going to be there for you when you need us to come in with a $10 million ad buy to help you win your election. And so the idea of an individual member of Congress being the elected representative for your community or your state going to Washington to represent their interests and voting your conscience, regardless of whether the bill is a Democrat bill or Republican bill, that has largely been squashed because of the massive amounts of money that these powerful interests have. Sure and the ability for them to, to make it so you can't do your job. Well, you look at just how much money was spent even just through the, the Iowa and New Hampshire and some yeah. of these states with ad, you know, for um, advertising yeah. and tens of millions of dollars yeah. for, for one state and a couple of weeks of work. It's like, yeah. you know, it just, I just look at that and I'm like, what else could that money be doing, exactly. right? Like, what else could it be doing? So. Is there a value in having the two, having parties at all? Or, I mean, I, le I just love to envision I idealistically this environment where you just have people speaking and you have to listen to them yes. and that's it. Like, we are still going to disagree, 100%. A married couple still disagrees and they choose to stay together and love each other, right? They're still going to disagree yes. on some stuff. So it's not that they're, it, you're going to take away, because I do think that it's important to have disagreements, because that is the only place where growth happens. That's right. I love personally having my mind changed. I think that's the best, because it, mean, it means I learned something. Exactly. So you need that. But people are already naturally going to do it, and it just seems like the parties are just a, 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 just a divisive division. They and are. there's corruption within it, and there's all the money that... It seems to me along um, a politician's path that when they start locally and grow and go with their plans, they have to compromise their integrity along the way because they need to get elected and they need money. And they, that seems like part of it. And if you didn't have all this money backing everything to perpetuate it along the way, maybe people would hold more integrity too along the way. Yeah. It doesn't have to be the way, but it is often what, what happens. There, there are a few examples of, of different people, both in the House and the Senate, both currently and in the past, um, who have, you know, been the outliers in maintaining their independent voice, while also remaining pragmatic of understanding that in the House you're one of 435 people, and if you want to pass a piece of legislation, you're going to have to work with your colleagues to be able to get that across the finish line. So this is one of the reasons why I didn't run for re-election in 2020. I felt that I had maximized my ability to make an impact in the House of Representatives where I was and that perhaps I could, I could be of more influence and impact outside of that body, mostly because, you know, there's four or five individuals who call the shots there, regardless of which party is in power. Hmm. 
they decide which bills come to the floor Who are they? for a vote. Who are these few people? It would be the Speaker of the House mm -hmm. and their top couple lieutenants mm -hmm. and then whoever the minority leader is. So mm -hmm. as, as power shifts hands back and forth, there's always a couple of people in the House who are the ones making decisions. Um, and they're influencing everybody underneath. Yep. Of which so you could have the best things. idea in the world. Right. And you could even go and, and convince half of your colleagues in Congress. You could get 218 you know, people to sign on to your bill. If the people at the top don't want to hear it, it won't see the light of day. <laughs> so, you know, for, for me at that, at that time, and, and I've not regretted this decision, uh, being, being in that position was incredibly frustrating, um, especially for someone like myself who wasn't towing the party line. And sometimes I agreed with them and sometimes I didn't. I was openly critical of, of, of the leadership when they were wrong and, you know, commending them when they were right. Uh, but, you know, there wasn't anybody trying to fast track my legislation through, uh, even though, you know, so I, I did my very best to introduce legislation that was always bipartisan, hmm. which was which was more often than not the case. I don't know the actual stats, but uh, you know when you're in a spot where you're not playing their money game and you're not playing their power game, then what's left? You know what I mean? What happens then? What does happen? Well, for me, I, I just felt like if 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 my ability to make an impact in the House of Representatives is limited to giving a speech on the House floor and introducing legislation and giving speeches about the legislation that the leadership is never going to pass because mm -hmm. I'm not part of the in club, mm -hmm. then uh, so much of what influences policy happens within our communities and happens within society. And so being able to uh, help influence that pressure and create that pressure externally was a path that I chose to take at that time. It's not to say I wouldn't go back into public service, uh, my there we go. My Let's position talk about is, that because you've been my, in the news a whole <laughs> lot lately. My my Tulsi for VP is what the you know. Well, yeah. Fox Town Hall was calling you out with Donald Trump. So and, I heard. I, I was sitting at, on my friend's couch in Virginia watching and were you? was was quite surprised to be honest. <laughs> I know enough about Washington to know that nothing is real until it's real. But saying that my goal is to be in a position of great impact to help solve these problems that we're talking about, period. And I don't exactly know what that position may be or where or when, but uh, I'm gonna keep fighting the fight and um, speaking the truth. And you know, we'll see how things shake out. Well, VP I've, seems like a pretty powerful position. It so could it seems be. like where you'd be able to do it could the be. good that you want to do. It could be. If that was an opportunity. Yeah, it could be. You know, w with that position in particular, um, it, I think it depends on, on the partnership and the relationship that's there. Uh, I'd hate to be in a position where your only task is to uh, be like Veep and the show. <laughs> Where you go to the ribbon cuttings and you know you do the you know uh, ceremonial things, but but um, I don't know if that's the right comparison. But uh, the point is, I want to be able to to work on the things that matter most for our country, and uh, I would love to have the opportunity to do that. Mm. What are those matters? What do you think are the most important pressing issues that need to be addressed in this next four-year term? Look, they, there, there are so many issues domestically and related to foreign policy that, that require urgent action. Everything from securing the border to drastically overhauling this thing we call an education system in this country that's unfortunately terribly failing. Kids and, you know, kids turning into adults entering into uh, their lives. Uh, when when you look at the statistics, and this is the beauty of writing a book, is you do a lot of research, I bet, I bet. <laughs> and and seeing the statistics of of how many kids graduate from high school, like basically unable to read or write really? in a way that will that will allow them to function in society. Mm. It, homeless is a huge problem in Hawaii, as it is growing in many other parts of our country. Uh, Lack of an affordable home in my home state of Hawaii 
that a qual qualifies. You qualify for an, uh, an to purchase an affordable home that costs seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for a single family wow. home. Wow. I mean, who can afford that? I mean, this That's is one of the point. things that I was listening to Bobby speak one night at a fundraiser, and he said that kids these days don't even entertain the idea of buying a house. How it's can not you? It's not even thought. How can you? You know, they're they're not making they're, the the salaries are not commensurate with the seven hundred fifty thousand dollar affordable Expenses home. Seem, things get more. Inflation is definitely and that's part happening, of the but it doesn't feel like people are getting paid more necessarily. They're not. And that that is and exactly that really the dramatically issue. swung during COVID. I feel like. Yeah, and and it's just and it's continued to get worse. Uh, and this this goes. You know, if you listen to again the politicians in Washington, they're like, "Oh, the economy's great, the numbers are great, the number of jobs are great, Bidenomics is great, it's working." Like. Why don't you get out and actually talk to some people? Yeah. Listen to what they have to say right. about how the cost of a head of lettuce has doubled. The cost of a gallon of milk has doubled. Just the basic things have doubled. Maybe what, they got a dollar or two raise per hour? That doesn't even come close mm. uh, to covering just the basic necessities, what to speak of anything uh, on top of that. There, there are a lot of issues here. There are a lot of issues related to foreign policy where we have um, people who are, are beholden to the military industrial complex in Washington from both parties whose answer for just about everything is war. Whether it's a new cold war or a proxy war or let's go drop some bombs on this country because they're the bad guys, but not actually in any of these scenarios thinking through does this serve the interest of the American people? Does it uh, increase our national security or undermine it? What are the short and long-term consequences of these decisions and actions, both on our economy and our, our freedom and our security? Um, what are the costs and consequences going to be in, in the people in these countries where we are proposing to go and drop bombs? This issue of, of war and peace um, was one of the main reasons that I ran for Congress and that I ran for president mm. because I came back from my first deployment to Iraq where I served in a medical unit uh, where for the year that I was there, every single day confronted with the high human cost of war, every day confronted with the, the glaring uh, profiteering of military, yeah. uh, of huge defense can you put contractors. In, like, can you put in layman's terms the business of war? Yes. Like, how, what, is the, what is happening? I'll start with what we're dealing with right now, where um, we, the taxpayers, have sent well over $100 billion to Ukraine mm -hmm. uh, to wage what is essentially a proxy war against Russia. Uh, if you hear any of our senior level officials or the people in the Biden-Harris administration talking about it, their goal is, to, is essentially to get rid of Putin, which is regime change. Uh, they, of course, never talk about, well, who then goes and fills that position? What kind of person could it be? Would it be better for us and the world or worse? None of these things are part of the conversation. There, especially lately, President Biden and others in his administration are telling us we shouldn't be so concerned about uh, this most recent tranche of $60 billion. Don't worry about it. That money is staying here because it's going to our big military defense contractors who are providing them with all the weaponry. So this is a job creation bill. <laughs> It's not a foreign aid package, it's a job creation bill. So rather than saying, okay, well, gosh, there's a lot of struggling small businesses in this country. There's a lot of struggling farmers. There's a lot of struggling uh, folks who are, are really trying to revive manufacturing in America again, who are trying right. to make it so that clothes can be made in America again, right. that we can be proud to wear and all of this stuff. No, forget about that. We're just gonna dump 60 billion more dollars into these big defense contractors who are making trillions in profiteering off of us war. constantly being in some state of yeah. war and trying to tell us that it's Joe Schmo who's working in the factory line uh, in you know Pennsylvania or wherever in this country that we're really doing this for him because he gets to work and get paid. 
Tell me what the ratio is of that $60 billion of how much goes to Joe mm -hmm. to take care of his family. Mm -hmm. It's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. While the CEOs and their lobbyists and all these people, they're raking it in. They are raking it in. It is disgusting to me to hear this coming from our president and people in his administration looking into the camera to the American people, celebrating this as Ukrainians are being killed, mm. as Russians are being killed, as innocent lives are being taken. And these very same people in this administration who claim to be doing this for Ukraine have stopped multiple attempts at a peace, uh, a treaty being negotiated from the first weeks of this war mm -hmm. occurring. And throughout this process now, it's going on almost two years. Everyone, no matter your position on the war or, or whatever it may be, I mean, I, I don't mm -hmm. know how to feel other than absolutely outraged by this. Who are the most corrupt people in the government right now? I mean, you want a list or? <laughs> yeah, like I feel like I've heard like the Clintons are horrible. And yeah. there's like, there's, there's some people that are just, they're just, they've created such horrible yeah. climate in the government yeah. and they've done so many horrible things. Yeah. Like, I mean, who needs they're, to be they're, out? They're, who needs to be out? President Biden cannot be allowed to stay in power. He can't even talk. That's one of the reasons. That's my opinion. Is That's also one of a, the There's reasons. a lot of evidence of it. <laughs> But there's a lot of people who are invested in him staying in that position because of the power it provides them. I was asked last night at an event that I spoke at, uh, you know, what do you think is going to happen? You think they're going to replace Biden? And like, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But that's the wrong question. Hmm. What's the right one? Well, what happens if he's replaced with Kamala Harris? What happens if he's replaced with, uh, I don't know, anybody? Fill in the blank. What's going to change? Nothing. Right, right. They, they, the policies, the agenda, and their objectives are the same, no matter who they put in power in yeah. today's Democratic Party. It's like especially in the Democratic Party, it's especially very, so. very corrupted in its Especially it's so. One and then agenda. you look at people like Mitch McConnell. I mean, you know, uh, there, there are many of these criticisms that can be made uh, about him as well, and there are others. So I, I obviously have been a Democrat for 20 years. Yeah. I joined the Democratic Biden Party at, at one point. So in the hopes that I could influence him, mm. uh, unfortunately, there was no opening mm. for that. But but I joined the Democratic Party, you know, over 20 years ago mm. as a 21 year old in Hawaii running for state house to protect the environment and take care of our home. Because that was a value of a more democratic yes. sort of liberal perspective was yes. like, let us on our own, take care. Like keep the Let's ocean our clean, own thing. keep the air Let's, clean. Yeah, organic, you know. Like. Right. And, and welcoming of people with different ideas, right. welcoming of people right. who, uh, you know, understanding the importance of free speech, welcoming and, and actually taking strong positions back then. The ACLU really did defend free speech. They really did defend civil liberties. They really did stand up against the government when they were trying to spy on Americans and that sort of thing. The ACLU now, unfortunately, it has become an extended arm of the Democratic Party, and they only defend the, the, the speech of those who they like and who they agree, the speech that they agree with, the speech that they're offended by. They're like, nah, nope, you're on your own. Mm. There's a lot of change. There's a lot of change that has to be made, and... And I think what's most important is for, you know, I can tell you the people who I know or the people who I've come into contact with, but it comes down to, to me, we have to be discerning, every one of us, in the information that we're consuming. Don't take anything at research. face value. Do yeah. your own research. Like uh, when you listen. were taught as a kid. Exactly. Think for listen. Yourself. And it's what I do. I listen to a lot of podcasts when I'm at the gym working out. And I don't just listen to the ones I like because, you know, they say things that I like. I'll listen to ones coming from people who I probably don't agree with on a lot of things, but I really want to know how they think. Right. And I really want to know why, like, what is their argument? Am I missing something here? And if I am, I want to know. Yeah. Don't be afraid to be exposed, as you said earlier, to these ideas that, that you, you may not be natural, or these voices that you may not be naturally uh, drawn to and, and have have those conversations mm -hmm. 
And, and to me, most importantly, because, you know, in, in our personal lives, in our professional lives, and certainly in politics, I can't think of a single person I agree with on everything. Exactly. Everything. Like I said, you marry someone that you right. don't agree with on everything. Right. Hopefully. Usually, yeah. <laughs> that would be mean, really boring. <laughs> yeah, it's 100%. Right. That would be really boring. But how boring would, be, would we be as a, because this is, this is a very real thing, though, where, where people think like, well, I'm not going to invite anybody I disagree with in my family to my Thanksgiving dinner or whatever. And the, what was it this last Thanksgiving? Was it the New York Times or, or somebody was like, here are the, the rules you should have around your Thanksgiving table or around Seriously? politics. Yes, it was horrible. Oh, that's so it, actually came, it actually came from Biden, though. I remember now they put out this Instagram post that was just bizarre. But, you know. Well, we could call it the Biden camp, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we can call it that. We can call it that. As, as we head into this election, I just really encourage people, no matter your political persuasion or affiliation or your feelings, be very discerning in, in your information gathering. Uh, don't take anything at face value. Question things that normally you wouldn't have questioned maybe a year ago or five years ago or 10 years ago. There was a bill that was introduced recently, for example, I think by Rand Paul or Tom Massey in Congress that would get rid of the Department of Education. Hmm. Seems like a crazy idea. Why not talk about it? Yeah. I wonder why they introduced it. Let's vet it, it out. Is there what a better way? If not a federal Department of Education, then, then what? What is the answer to that? that? We need to be comfortable in having these conversations and we need leaders who are comfortable in us challenging what is seen as the quote unquote norm. Those in power are so terrified of people like Donald Trump and they, they use this word. It's because he challenges every single norm. My view is, again, regardless of who you like or don't like in politics, the norm hasn't been working out really well for us for a really long time. And so the only way we change that, we go back to the Declaration of Independence where our founding fathers said our government exists only with the consent of the governed. If we don't like what's happening now, we are the only ones who can make that change. Fundamental to that change is protecting our individual liberty and freedom to be able to cast our vote, to be able to use our voice, to be able to challenge those in power without fear of, of retaliation or repercussions. So whether your candidate is a Democrat or Republican or independent, I just encourage people to, to look at them and ask questions through this foundational framework of freedom and the Constitution. Because believe it or not, there are people who are running for office and in office who don't believe in it. They don't believe in freedom of speech. They don't believe that the Constitution applies mm. to us, which is a really dangerous thing. Wow. Well, I asked you who needs to go, but then there's a lot needs, of them. Who needs to stay or who needs yeah. to be brought in or back in? Yeah. I don't know if you're willing to say who you think should be president or not, but if you're not, then I'd love to hear the pros the pros and cons, or at least the pros of, of, of what we have to work with right now and why they might be a good person for the job. I don't think we have enough time. There, there's, there's too many issues to get into as we look at each of the candidates who are running for president right now. Uh, I will tell you with full certainty, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, unfortunately, the Biden-Harris administration or anyone that today's Democratic Party would put up would only further erode our republic and undermine our freedom. So as you're thinking through your options, it is most important, in my opinion, that we stop the, uh, stop the destruction. Mm -hmm. We have to stop uh, this, this quick trajectory we have found ourselves in that is leading us towards darkness and towards a society that is less and less free and more and more like 
a dictatorship or a banana republic. The rest we can talk about, the rest we can look at and compare and contrast, and that's what these elections are for. Yeah. Look at the issues and look at where, where do they stand, how would they handle uh, different situations. Um, and, and it's important for us to, to engage in that process so that we can make the best choice. It may not be the choice you want. It may not be the ideal situation. These elections very rarely are. Let's be realistic and make decisions that are rooted in freedom and the Constitution. That might be the answer to this last question, but with your book, what do you hope people take away from it? What do you hope they learn from it? And what a great time to have the book come out, obviously, with everything going yeah. on, for people to learn about you know, your journey and yeah. the parties and um, you know, your, also your upbringing and what's made you have that, have that sort of shift in your own life. I, I titled the book For Love of Country because that's what drives me. Mm -hmm. I never, when I ran for and I was elected to the State House in Hawaii when I was 21, never once in my mind then nor at any point in the period from then to now have I thought, well, here's what I need to do to further a political career. It's never been it's never been a career. I don't even know how to think about it in those, mm. those terms because the question I've, I've asked myself constantly is how and where can I best be of service? Uh, I left that seat in the state legislature because I volunteered to deploy to Iraq with my mm. Hawaii National Guard unit uh, in 2004. Uh, I was gone from Hawaii for almost two years. And what I experienced there in combat uh, in a combat zone at a time when the Iraq war was at its height in 2005, it changed me in so many ways and opened my eyes to, to things I had never thought about before. Growing up in Hawaii, it's easy to be a little comfortable and focused on what's happening in our own backyard. Uh, Which to, is just a lot of beautiful waterfalls. I mean, and beaches know. and stuff. You know, <laughs> we have bad ties. traffic too, <laughs> but yes, <laughs> um, so much that I love about my home. But when I came home, uh, I was expected to go back and okay, you can run for your seat in the legislature again, get back to your life, and I couldn't. I couldn't do it because I felt a sense of duty and responsibility. Uh, both to, to those who um, were killed mm. uh, in combat from our unit while we were there, mm. uh, but also to those who I would never meet, to the reason why they were willing to put their lives on the line. I knew that I had to take those experiences and to try to make an impact um, that would help prevent uh, us as a country and leaders from making decisions to go to war unnecessarily again. Um, it is my desire to be of service, service to God, service to our country, service to others, has been and continues to be my driving force. Um, it's what made it so that making the decision to leave the Democratic Party wasn't one that ultimately was hard to make because um, my allegiance has never been to the party. It has always been to our country. And I will continue to, um, to find ways to make that impact, to make that positive impact, and find ways uh, where I can, I can best serve. All right. Well, that might be in a varied degree of places, and I'm excited to yeah. see that unfold for you. you. We barely talked about fitness, but we I definitely know. Next share time. love for it. Next, next, those next dead podcast lifts, will be in the gym. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that. I like that. Let's do Our it. real spirit will really come out. Exactly. <laughs> well, thank, thank you so, so much. This yeah. has been a blast. I thank can't you. wait to do it again. Thank you for the time. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.